Oh, that's I've boring. Yeah, well. <laughs> All right. Um, I've turned it on. It's on. I have control of the volume. You don't have to worry about it. So okay, so so when I go up, you'll turn it off. I will bring you up. Okay. This clip's okay. on your belt. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you very much for coming tonight. It's just a pleasure to see you here. Uh, we wondered a little bit if we went as late in the year as this, whether people would be attracted to be out in their gardens or something. So it's wonderful to have you here for Visionary Conversations. And to begin, I'd like to thank the University of Manitoba Alumni Association for its sponsorship of the refreshments here and at other Visionary Conversations in this series which has been a new and exciting adventure for us at the University of Manitoba this past year. This is our seventh visionary conversation in the series held here on the Fort Garry campus, and our 10th when we count three visionary conversations that we did for alumni on the road uh, in Victoria, Vancouver, and Calgary. This is the final installment of this uh, award-winning series for the 2011-2012 season. Earlier this month, Visionary Conversations received a gold medal in the community outreach category from the Canadian Council for Advancement in Education. So we're pleased that it's been uh, a success with you and that you keep coming, and we're pleased that it's been recognized by our professional colleagues as being a good, uh, a good outreach event. It's been successful really thanks to the outstanding quality of our faculty members uh, who participate, as well as your participation and continuing interest. So if you uh, want to follow tonight's conversation on Twitter, you should use the hashtag hash UMVisionary. The intention of Visionary Conversations is to bring together some of the leading minds at the University of Manitoba for a dialogue with the broader community. The University of Manitoba is the home of visionaries, trailblazers, innovators, pioneers, mavericks, defenders, and explorers. Our theme this evening, the food we eat, is a discussion about the safety and food we eat from a local as well as a global perspective. So let me just explain the format if you haven't been here before. Each of our four panelists will speak for five to seven minutes to comment on the theme. They'll uh, use some visual images that'll be on the overhead screen to illustrate their points. And then we'll have a discussion from the floor. Uh, I'll invite you to make comments and questions. We will have some wireless microphones and a couple of colleagues circulating through the room with those. Uh, and please wait until the microphone comes because we're recording uh, 
uh, even if you think your voice can be heard, we're recording the proceedings and we want to have you uh, speaking into the microphone. Uh, I'll moderate the discussion if you get rowdy. <laughs> and just before 8.30, uh, I'll, I'll uh, stop the questions and uh, ask my colleague, Dr. Gary Glavin, Associate Vice President of Research, to provide a short summation of the key points. So that's our plan. Uh, we'll try to stick to the time because we appreciate your commitment to be here and we want to treat your time commitment with respect. Let me introduce our first speaker from the panel tonight. Dr. Ryan Caldwell is an associate professor in the Faculty of Agricultural and Food Sciences. He conducts research in development economics, international trade, and the economics of food policy. Recent research topics that he's worked on include the effects of high commodity prices on international food aid, food aid in, the world in World Trade Organization negotiations, and the political determinants of agricultural policies. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Cogwell. Great, thanks David. Um, I'm gonna start on a bit of a tangent. I'm gonna be discussing food security in developing countries. Uh, and just to note, when I use the term security, I'm not referring to food safety or any type of military um, security. I'm, I'm referring more to uh, adequate access to uh, sufficient quantities of nutritious food. So when I use food security, that's what I mean. Uh, so this is a map that shows uh, sort of a current snapshot of the state of, of hunger in the world today, aggregated on a national basis. Uh, this is the International Food Policy Research Institute's Global Hunger Index. So they look at a number of indicators, uh, prevalence of undernutrition, child mortality, and construct an index that goes from zero to 100. The higher is the number, the higher is the prevalence of, of hunger or malnutrition. Um, and you can see we have a range of countries going from extremely alarming, the red countries, uh, down through to the green countries, which are the lowest uh, incidence of, of hunger in these countries. And then the white countries are, are industrialized rich countries, and IFPRI doesn't calculate the, the index for these countries. Uh, so the good news when we look at a map like this is every year that, the, that IFPRI calculates uh, this index and, and generates this map, it looks a little bit better. Uh, so conditions are getting better in all regions and most countries. Uh, the bad news is that we still have a map like this. Ultimately, we'd like to see a map like this that is all white, where, where if he doesn't even calculate these things because it's not worth it. Um, so we are in a world where uh, food insecurity is a serious issue. So what can we do about it? Well, a seemingly obvious solution would be try to increase domestic agricultural production within national borders and attain self-sufficiency. But what we've learned is that food supply is not sufficient for solving either famine problems or chronic food security issues. Uh, increasing food supply often does not address these problems. And uh, what I've done here is I've taken the, the Global Hunger Index map and just pulled a few countries out for illustration purposes. So I'm not sure if you can read that, but those two are Niger and India. And those are two countries that rank quite highly in measures of self-sufficiency, so most of what is consumed at home in, in terms of cereal grains is, is produced at home. But they also rank very high on, on measures of hunger. Um, Two other countries, uh, Tunisia and Costa Rica, score quite low on measures of self-sufficiency, so a lot of what is consumed at home is actually produced abroad and imported. Uh, but they rank lower on, on measures of um, global hunger. So food security is a little better in these countries. So there's a lot of other things going on in these countries that I won't talk about, but this is just to point out that self-sufficiency does not equate to uh, food security. A local food supply can be very quickly disrupted by things like weather shocks outbreaks of violence, um, increases in input costs. So food self-sufficiency, another option, well, what about international trade? Uh, consider maybe a small developing country that has a fairly strong manufacturing base and can export in a large enough amount to uh, get foreign exchange to buy food imports and sustain you know, a fairly reasonable level of nutrition. Well, this country may still be relatively poor, but is, is for the time being achieve, achieving um, adequate diets. But in 2008, we hit a situation like this. So food prices, these are cereal grain prices, spiked way, way up. So a lot of net food importing developing countries were faced with very high import bills. And food security got worse in some of these countries as a result. Uh, so international trade can be very important in that it increases income, but it has to increase income by an awful lot to uh, compensate for shocks that we've seen like this. Uh, so, the, I guess the point I want to make here is that neither of these alone necessarily can be or are either necessary nor sufficient to achieve food security. So what do we need? Ultimately what we need is income growth in these countries. 
Um, hunger and malnutrition, food insecurity, is fundamentally a function of poverty. Right? So unless we uh, solve the poverty problem, we're not going to solve food security problems. So this diagram, you can ignore all the colored lines, just focus on the black line, which shows the negative relationship between that global hunger index on the vertical axis and income on the horizontal axis. You can see a very strong negative relationship here. Um, and this holds regardless of a country's status uh, on self-sufficiency or on trade. Across the board, high-income countries do not have... I'm sorry? Uh, can the lights be dimmed? I'm not sure. Someone's asking. Um, but the, the relationship is strongly negative across any type of country. Okay? So ultimately, we need to solve the income problem. And how do we do that? Well, like many problems in developing countries, there's no easy solution. Um, and the short answer is we don't know how to do this. We need to increase income, but what we've learned is that we just don't know how to trigger transformational income growth in developing countries. Um, despite what a lot of commentators will tell you, we don't really very well understand why some countries are poor and some countries are rich. Uh, most grand theories tend to fall apart on close scrutiny. Uh, you know, economics, the, the way we study these things is fundamentally a social science, right? So we're studying the behavior and the interaction of people. And people often don't behave as we either expect them to or as even they, they tell us they will. Uh, so I've taken this quote here from a food uh, security study in Morocco. And uh, a family was being studied who was certainly measurably food insecure. And when asked what they would do with more income, the head of the household said, well, I'd buy more and better food for my family. But a look around the household revealed that they had a color TV and a DVD player and a parabolic antenna and trinkets on shelves. And when asked about this, the, the head of the household responded, well, television is more important than food. So, you know, the, the, the policy issue here is that we don't know how to address these issues when people, the part of the problem is that we don't know how to address these issues when people respond in ways that we either don't expect or they don't even necessarily tell us we, we, that they will respond in. So what can we do? Well. If we can't trigger transformational income growth, what can we do? Well, we can provide food aid, uh, but food aid is really useful only in, in specific circumstances. So emergencies um, and humanitarian crises. And certainly no one receiving food aid could be labeled as food secure. Um, agricultural R&D, so primary R&D and extension work is important. Uh, certainly there's a very wide gap in productivity measures between uh, developing country agriculture and developed country agriculture. So that will go a long ways, but only in that it will increase the income of people in developing countries. So science certainly cannot solve the food security problem. I mean, we already have enough food in the world. The issue is, is distribution. So what we need to do is increase the incomes of those people who are food insecure. We need to advocate for policies that increase incomes across a range of industries, not just agriculture, including agriculture. So things like property rights, functioning markets, and, um, and uh, economic institutions. And I will end it with that. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Our next speaker is Dr. Shirley Thompson, who is an associate professor at the National Natural Resource Institute. Her research focuses on food-based community economic development in northern communities. She's been elected as the co-president of the Environmental Studies Association in Canada for the last three years, is a board member of Food Secure Canada and the Association for Social Economic Research. In the past five years, Dr. Thompson has published uh, papers in referee journals, a book, five book chapters, 15 video productions, three magazine articles, 65 conference presentations. <clears throat> Welcome home. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Dr. Shirley Thompson. I research in a food security hotspot, and it's not a developing country. It's in Canada, it's northern Manitoba, and many northern um, provinces and Nunavut is like this. So their poverty is high and chronic unemployment exists. Here you see people with hoes and shovels sharing them and a rototiller digging up basically clay soil. But what's lacking in these communities are tractors. In all the communities I visited, there wasn't one tractor with a heavy clay soil. That's what's needed for real farming work. As well, there is very limited um, infrastructure for fishing. So um, unfortunately, as a result, there's no federal wharves. There's no uh, different programming for, to ensure fish processing as well as fish um, packing. 
So I did a study that looked at 14 northern Manitoba communities. Six of these were fly-in. Three of them were train only. That meant no road access, no store in these communities, and no commuter train. So when they went to Thompson for food, they came back several days later. Food security rates are very high in these communities, 75% in northern Manitoba communities. That's a survey of 533 households in these 14 communities. That's eight times the Canadian average. And 33, one third of those are severely food insecure. That's more than are food secure. So the food security rates vary across these communities. The best one was Nelson House. And there's a variety of reasons for this. But when you ask people in Nelson House, they say the reason is the Country Foods Program. And that this program that provides 1,500 out of 2,000 people with food, focusing on elders, focusing on single moms, focusing on weddings to get them through those moments where where money and food help is needed, um, provides a lot of assurance in an environment where there are no food banks. So Country Foods Programs considers fishing. It has seven people working in fishing, in hunting, in gardening. In southern Manitoba, it's relatively easy, if you have money, to get food. There's stores that you can go to and, and public transportation in Winnipeg. In northern Manitoba, it's a lot more difficult. The complexity is there might not be a store in your community, and if there is a store, it might be on another island. And during freeze up or spring break up, you have to take a helicopter to get to that store, which costs a considerable amount of money. And when you get to the store, the prices are very high, and you can see this is the whole Prados aisle, and there's hardly anything there. So it, it's wilted. People complain that it's very wilted, and the cost of fruits and vegetables are two times the amount. And it's much higher in the fly-in communities than that, uh, particularly for fruit and vegetables. So who has seen a price for 10 pounds of potatoes of $22? In Winnipeg, that just doesn't happen. That's five times as much as you would pay in a store, and probably eight or 10 times if you're a good uh, economical shopper. So food security in these environments is possible. And we found that with a statistical model that showed that, I'm just going to go back to this slide, that showed that with the country foods program, 40% food security, that's an increase from 25% to 40%. So a considerable increase for very little money. Now, that was the most important variable. If you add roads and public transit, two variables together, you can get 50%. Add them both together, and you'll have 95% food, food security in these communities. So food security is possible. It's not impossible. And key to that, key to all of these, is, is a country foods program. This is working with the traditional hunting and fishing and sharing. Who would think in a capitalist economy that sharing would be key to food security? And use, working within the cycles of nature sustainably, there is a conservation aspect to this as well, an educational as well as a cultural aspect that works with the seasons. And so in spring and fall, you'll have geese. And smoking of fish, so a more pro processing within the community. Instead of the commercial model, which is just fish plants that pack them out and don't allow actually public facilities, stores, even a sports fishing lodge to serve fish in these northern communities. So they have to fly it out and fly it back in again. Gardening also improves um, the impact of the country foods and incre can increase it to 60 and 70 percent. And it's taken up by the community. We've had the funnest, the most fun um, gardening parties. And here's a bunch at the University of Manitoba from Island Lake. So we've been training uh, First Nations people with Four Arrows Regional Health Authority. We're also working on a fish buying club with Nietzsche Foods that tries to improve the fishing um, take home. We found Surprisingly, that fishermen in Garden Hill and Island Lakes had 100% food insecurity. And we asked them why. 
they're bragging. We would have never known. They were bragging about what great fishermen they were and how they knew where all the fishing spots were. But the cost of gas is so high that they live hand to mouth. And they provide us with food in southern Manitoba. Because there's only a fish, process, a fish um, packing plant, they have to fly out whole fish instead of a third or a quarter. So it takes a lot of money um, from their take home pay. We've also done a lot of, of um, video work with communities. And we have a Harvesting Hope video. Um, part of our training included working with, um, uh, you'll recognize someone from Vitality Gardening here. So we brought youth together with experts and train them on video as well as doing our own video work. So we have a number of videos we produce from these exchanges and we're going to show one called Harvesting Hope in Northern Manitoba. And I have a few copies here if it, anyone would like one at the end. I'm showing only the trailer but it's a 37 minute video. This large survey is a wake-up call to Canadians that it's not only third world countries that have food insecurity and people going hungry, it's also people in, um, in Canada, in remote communities, in northern communities that have limited incomes and very extremely high costs for food. What is an obstacle is the perception that the treaty right cannot be used for commercial purposes. And these are, the, these are the, the old ideas that we have to break down and destroy. Fishermen used to be able to set four nets and get um, maybe 40 tubs of fish. Now they have to set 40 nets to get four tubs of fish. You know, it's, that's been a total reverse. The flooding of the lake really affects our, our food chain as far as everything that we get off the land. And it's really damaged a lot of our uh, hunting areas, our fishing areas, and even our berry picking areas. They're being sent out and coming back with no legs or legs or arm, toes, fingertips. Virtually every fiber of policy in Canada, um, of the government, of the political and economic system, works against uh, the food security of northern communities. It has to go beyond the idea of uh, supplementing the freight costs in the case of remote communities. It has to engage the people in the idea of food production to the extent they can in the climate in which they reside. So we need to get busy, you know, growing our potatoes, our carrots, our vegetables uh, in, in, in great numbers to sustain all our population. Thank you, Shirley. Our next speaker is Dr. Rick Hawley, who is a distinguished professor of food microbiology and food safety in the Faculty of Agricultural and Food Sciences. Rick has an active research program on microbial ecology of meats, use of natural antimicrobials in food, and zoonotic pathogens in animals and the environment. He served on the advisor, academic advisory panel of the Canadian Food Inspection Agency and was invited to testify before the House of Commons Agriculture Food Safety Committee and at the Wetherill Investigations into Listeriosis in 2009. Please join me in welcoming Rick Hawley. How do I get to my uh, stuff? Would that life were always this simple. <laughs> Thank you. I want to talk about uh, food safety. Um, and uh, the first slide um, shows some examples of things that you're very familiar with. And uh, if you look at various areas of the slide, you'll see that uh, 
um, in, in certain pockets. Uh, for example, um, up in this area, <coughs> excuse me, and down in this area, we have foods that we generally re regard as, as being perishable. Um, and, uh, and, and most often we find, because they have high concentrations of protein, um, they're very susceptible to the growth of uh, a whole variety of different uh, bacteria, both spoilage organisms and pathogenic organisms. But hidden here, and maybe not obvious to uh, many of you in the audience, is um, fruits and, and vegetables. And, and I'm sure that those of you who pay attention to news media reports about foodborne illness outbreaks are uh, very familiar with uh, the increasing frequency with which we see foods of plant origin now causing foodborne illnesses. And that's unsettling. We don't know how to stop this. The organisms that cause foodborne illness generally reside in, in animals that we use as food. And, and of course, the, the transfer of the animals serve as little factories. And so the organisms don't make the animals sick, E. coli and salmonella, the organisms multiply in the animals um, and upon defecation um, end up in the fields <coughs> where, of course, the manure is used as fertilizer. And so you can see the, uh, the continuity here. And we've got to do a better job, really, at, at separating animal from from plant agriculture if we want to, in the future, consume vegetables that are uh, not likely to cause us to become ill. So having prefaced that, I mean, I think it's important for you to realize that no matter what policies get developed, uh, those policies have to be based on risk. And, and there are risks inherent in the foods that we eat because we don't eat sterile food. Um, that differ from food to food. People in different areas eat different food products and so are, are susceptible more frequently to, to different organisms than people who live in other geographic regions. If we eat uncooked vegetables, then we're more at risk to um, foodborne illnesses that are caused by contaminated vegetables. In fact, if you take a look at the data, such as they are, um, about 14% of foodborne illness outbreaks are caused by produce now. Back in 1970, that was unheard of. Produce didn't cause people to become sick. So we're contaminating the agricultural environment and, and we've got to find ways in which we address these issues to prevent this from being a, an even greater problem than it currently is. Having said that, food in Canada is 99% safe. Bet you didn't think I was going to say that. <laughs> but before you write a congratulatory letter to, um, to Mr. Harper, I think it's Im important for you to take um, a little closer look at the data that, uh, that, that <coughs> comprise that figure of 99.9%. .9%. In Canada, somewhere between uh, 11 and 13 million people, one in three, suffer from foodborne illness once a year. Now in Canada, we, we prepare, if we eat three meals a day, the population in, in its entirety, some 36 billion meals. 36 billion meals. Now using Health Canada data, on the basis of 11 to 13 million cases of foodborne illness each year, what you see um, is, is that one in 3,000 meals is contaminated with an organism, accidentally contaminated with an organism that will cause foodborne illness. We eat roughly 1,000 and 100, 1,100 meals every year. So the accumulation is that once every three years we'll come down with foodborne illness. Now, fine, most of us, most healthy, healthy individuals can, can handle that. But it's the kids and the old folks, the folks my age and older, that are really susceptible. In fact, when you take a look at the data uh, that come from other countries, and we borrow much of um, our foodborne illness data from other countries, um, what, what you see is most cases of foodborne illness occur in 
children under six years of age. And that's where the mortalities occur. Somewhere between 300 and 600 people each year in Canada die from foodborne illnesses. So it's not an insignificant problem. Fairly comparable to the number of homicides that occur in Canada every year if you really want to uh, uh, examine the seriousness of, of the issue. Well, what's wrong with the food safety system in Canada? Well, number one, if we were really serious about addressing issues associated with foodborne illness, we'd try and find out what it was that was causing us to become ill. That's not an understatement. We don't do foodborne illness surveillance. One more minute? Two? <laughs> we don't do foodborne illness surveillance the way that we should. We have no idea whether or not there are more cases of illness caused by chicken wings or ice cream, and we leave it there. Why is it important? If we were able to find out what it was that caused foodborne illness, we could put together programs that addressed those most pressing issues and solve the problem and reduce foodborne illness. The other thing that uh, needs to be improved in Canada is food inspection. Um, Foodborne illness uh, and food safety are a multi-jurisdictional um, issue in Canada. We have the federal government, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, responsible for inspecting 20% of the food plants in Canada, 20%. The rest devolve upon the provincial government, upon those territorial governments and municipal governments. And municipal governments are also responsible for food service not airplane food. <laughs> Nobody is responsible for that. <laughs> That's why Air Canada gave up. <laughs> the other uh, allied issue, you can't inspect safety into food anyway. Um, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency has 3,500 inspectors. Guess what? The USDA have 1,800. But they have two agencies that look after foodborne illness. Um, the, uh, the FDA has 8,000. But on the same basis, population basis, proportionately speaking, we should have, or the Americans should have 35,000. You can't inspect safety in the food. The responsibility is, is at the industry level. The other thing that's, that's wrong with the food safety uh, uh, system in, in Canada um, is that those agencies responsible for food safety are little domains, operate autonomously and don't speak to each other. And that needs to change. And it needs to change soon. We see, whoops, we see um, greater in numbers of, uh, um, greater quantities of food being imported uh, every year. Um, over the last uh, 15 years, what we see is an almost doubling in the amount of food we bring in from other countries. Almost double. Canadian Food Inspection Agency has not kept pace with efforts to interrogate these foods or set up um, human resource um, capability to look after um, threats associated with, with foodborne illness coming from foods imported from other countries. Um, the, um, the third thing, fourth thing rather, that I think needs, needs to, uh, to be um, addressed in uh, uh, a very <coughs> mature fashion is, is the reliance or the use that uh, government makes upon investing in uh, recalls and traceability to indicate what it is that, uh, that they are doing to address issues associated with uh, with food safety. The, um, the data clearly show we all want traceability in food. I bought a package of almonds the other day from the superstore um, and it was packaged uh, in, in Montreal. Didn't say where the almonds came from. They were raw almonds. They didn't come from, they didn't come from California. They had to come from some faraway place because all almonds in California are pasteurized now because they made Canadians sick a few years ago with salmonella. 
Traceability is important, but when you take a look at epidemiology of foodborne illness outbreaks and recall, what you find is the bottleneck associated with foodborne illness outbreaks is not recall, it's finding the food that's causing the problems. I've got three foodborne illness outbreaks involving 3,000 people in the United States, and the recalls came anywhere from three to six months after the first person got sick. We need better forensic epidemiology in order to find the food that causes these illnesses. And then, and only then, does recall and traceability play a useful role. Ladies and gentlemen, um, one last slide. Uh, we've got to be wary of surprises, <laughs> and we certainly don't want to be bitten by the food that, uh, that we want to consume. I'll close there, and so thank you for your attention. <clears throat>Thank you, Rick. Our fourth speaker this evening is Dr. Joyce Slater, who is an assistant professor in human nutritional sciences. She's in the faculty of human ecology, where she does research on community nutrition. Her research interests include the socio-environmental context of obesity, nutritional needs of vulnerable populations, and the role of food and nutrition literacy in health promotion and disease prevention. Joyce is also a registered dietitian and worked in various public health organizations for 18 years before obtaining her PhD and joining the faculty of the University of Manitoba. Joyce Slater. Thank you. Thank you. We live in a very complex food world. The last 100 years have seen the greatest changes in how and what we eat since the discovery of fire. Preservation of basic foods commercially and through home canning at the end of the 19th century was a great leap forward in improving human diets, followed by the marvel of refrigeration after World War I. These technologies were the platform upon which the processed food industry has flourished, ramping up after World War II, when housewives wanted to spend less time cooking and food companies sought peacetime markets for new food processing technologies developed during the war. Convenience foods grew steadily until the mid-1980s, surging ahead with the advent of fast and ultra-processed foods. These are very palatable um, foods that contain high levels of fat, sugar, and salt, have long, stable shelf lives, often requiring no refrigeration and frequently having numerous artificial colors and preservatives. And all of this has been underwritten by cheap oil. Such has been the expansion of these products that today more than 20,000 new foods are introduced into the marketplace every year, the vast majority having the same basic ingredients. White flour, vegetable oils, sugar, salt, and corn, primarily in the form of high fructose corn syrup ending up in soft drinks and most processed foods. Think chips, soft drinks, frozen pastas, pizzas, pancakes, crackers and other salty snacks, candies, ketchup, and the endless cases of ready-to-eat meals. And this growth is not restricted to North America. I took these pictures last week in a new supermarket in rural Kenya. These foods now dominate our landscape, which no longer consists of the local grocery store, family table, and occasional restaurant, but every conceivable place humans go. Indeed, it is hard to imagine any place in our society without a food court, candy and chip display, or vending machine. We eat for every occasion, we eat everywhere, and the concept of meals has given way to handheld convenience on the go. We have hundreds of food products designed and marketed exclusively for children. This is called market, market segmentation. We now eat over half our food outside the home and the family meal is a dying art. While men have increased their participation in domestic duties, women still perform the majority of domestic work despite their increase in paid employment. This and other demands on our time has led to a de-skilling of many with respect to food and nutrition knowledge and skills further increasing dependence on processed convenience foods with questionable nutrition. Now, the processed food industry is not evil. They have given us many wonderful things. A takeout or frozen pizza on Friday night after a busy week can be a godsend. But being de-skilled in a land of branded processed food is a recipe for confusion. 
nutrition knowledge is equated with knowing we should eat our fruits and vegetables and the four food groups. Who does not know this in this day and age? But this knowledge is little comfort when one third of our calories come from foods outside those groups. Adding to our confusion, daily news reports on the latest research gives us new miracles to avoid or embrace to ward off cancer and other ills. On top of this, food companies try desperately to convince us that their products are the answer to our nutritional needs. Candies with real fruit and vitamin C, chocolate bar in a jar. <laughs> Nutella was actually sued recently over their health claims. Pepsi trying for a healthy image. McDonald's bringing real moms into their kitchens to win their stamp of approval. And fast food restaurants distancing themselves from their dirty deep fried cousins with claims of fresh and nutritious. Pita Pitt tells us to just say no to high fat, high carb, high sodium junk food and yes to good food served fresh and fast. Nothing's deep fried, battered or grilled in fat. We don't add salt unless you tell us you want it. And we don't stuff our good for you, great tasting fillings in big wads of bread as thick as mattresses. <laughs> so here's a little table with some nutrition information on it. And this one is a whole wheat pita with falafel hummus and tzatziki. And the comparatively healthier choice on the right is a Big Mac. <laughs> Cheerios have more sodium than potato chips. And if you still aren't confused, are you buying organic, local, gluten-free? Are you growing your own garden? What about vitamins and antioxidants? And I haven't even mentioned the weight loss industry. Well, so what, you may ask. Isn't it my choice what I eat? Of course it's your choice. But would you not rather it was an informed choice, easy to make, and promoted your health, or at least didn't kill you? Unfortunately, in Manitoba, we do not have an environment that fosters any of this. Actually, in many places in the world, most places we don't. Last year's provincial report on the health of Manitobans revealed that most of us don't eat enough fruits and vegetables, despite knowing we should do so. Almost 60% of us are overweight or obese. And most alarming, almost one third of our children are as well. Only 6% of us get enough fiber and 82% have too much sodium in our diets. This very busy slide shows that 62% of our causes of death are nutrition related. Renal dialysis, primarily due to complications of diabetes, costs over $60,000 per person per year. Last year, for the first time, Manitoba spent over $5 billion on health care, a liability that threatens other areas of expenditure, including education, social services, and real preventive health care beyond websites encouraging us to make healthy lifestyle choices. Over 10% of our population is food insecure, and as Dr. Thompson just told us, up north it is much, much higher. Only half of Manitoba students in middle school get home economics, food, nutrition, education, and instruction time has been reduced in recent years. This drops off to 6% of students in grade 12. Yet Manitoba has no nutrition strategy, and the federal government is not stepping up to the plate. A report in today's Ottawa Citizen criticizes the federal government for disbanding the National Sodium Working Group and doing nothing to combat sodium in the food supply. And we have just about the highest in the world. Clearly, we are not in good nutritional shape. Obesity and hypertension, it seems, are the logical responses to our food environment. So what should be done? University of Manitoba can play a leadership role in facilitating a nutrition and food strategy for the province promoting education and research in areas of policies to promote healthier food environments and food nutrition literacy among Manitobans, along with the continued development of functional foods using Manitoba ingredients for provincial and global markets. A strategy involving health, agriculture, education, the private sector and others could promote local foods, address public health nutrition and ecological issues, and have significant economic spin-offs. Manitoba has the right ingredients to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. So, folks, we've come to the part of the evening that's the conversation. I'll look to you for comments and questions. And as I mentioned, I have colleagues in the, uh, uh, 
in the room who have microphones, so if you can just indicate that you're interested, we'll have someone come in and speak to you. But just to, to begin, I'm going to ask each of the panelists in, this, in the order in which they spoke, <clears throat> if you could make one change, possibly a change in government policy, possibly a change in individual or collective practice that would um, most effectively address the kinds of issues you've talked about, what would the, what would the one change be that you would propose? Ryan, I'll ask you first. That's a tough one. It would be easier for me to answer what I would not want them to do. Um, and I, I, maybe I'll answer that way. What one thing would you leave the same? I'm sorry? What one thing would you leave the same? What one thing would I leave <laughs> no, the no, same? Well, I, I guess what I would encourage policymakers to do is uh, not jump into making policy decisions just for the sake of, of enacting a policy to, to uh, address a problem that, that will at best not solve the problem, that worse make it, make it even worse than it already is. Shirley? Support for local, sustainable foods, and in the northern context, that's support for country food programs. And removing the legislative barriers, right now you can't serve local food, you can't serve local fish, you can't serve local meat, without it, it being inspected in a federal food facility, which is only available in the, in the south, right? So it has to be flown up and flown back again when it comes to fish and, and meat. Mm, thank you. Rick? I have two things. <laughs> Can I have two? Sure. <laughs> I could say no, but I'm gonna, I know you'll mention them both anyway. So. <laughs> well, fair, fairly simple, yet very, very complex because of the way the Constitution is arranged in, uh, in Canada. It would be delightful to be able to have uh, those folks uh, in the various government agencies uh, responsible for food safety uh, work together across jurisdictions. Um, the autonomous activity that takes place and the suspicion that, that occurs when, uh, when there is a crisis is, is a very, very large impediment to the smooth operation and utilization of resources that we have to solve food, uh, foodborne illness outbreaks. And the second thing um, is, is related to produce contamination. You know what? If we stopped feeding animals salmonella and E. coli, their poop wouldn't contain it. And the proportion of vegetables and fruits that were contaminated would be reduced. And the numbers of people that get ill as a result of consumption of these products uh, without cooking would be reduced. <coughs> Thank you. Joyce. Um, I would say I would like to see governments at all levels stop extolling and exhorting us to adopt healthy lifestyles in a vacuum without the proper environmental policy supports to make that happen. All right. Thank you each. Folks, comments, questions? Just raise your hand and someone will, okay, so here's one down here. And Chris, in the middle over here. But back in the uh, 1800s, they had a successfully successful <coughs> dairy industry in Yellowknife. Now, the Laplanders in the northern Scandinavian countries milk the reindeer. How about milking the moose? <laughs> also, I hear that the, uh, the uh, new, uh, new uh, bacon milkshake by uh, Burger King contains all the four food groups. Um, so there are some things happening in the north around that. No, um, Nelson House has taken down a caribou herd from Brochet to Nelson House and is fostering that conservation. So that, that's similar to Lapland, actually. So this is a herd of reindeer, basically. They're not milking them yet, but I'll pass that <laughs> idea on. I think they could do it. We could make some nice milkshakes up there. But there is lots of gardening, and there's such positive. I would say the money that's put into it by government is so small, $1 or $2 per capita. 
for sharing shovels, sharing a rototiller, and the results. There are hundreds of gardens. There is, are 500 gardens, uh, according to my last paper, um, in the last five years that have just been generated as a result of so little uh, supports. So, you know, if, if more was given to the north, you would see the incredible results, but it it's has to be focused on sustainable, um, gar sustainable food systems, so something local. Thank you. Up here in the middle. Hello. Um, I had a question for uh, Dr. Uh, Slater as well as another question for Dr. Cardwell. Um, for Dr. Slater, uh, I've heard a lot of nutritional information throughout my life. I don't know how literate I am depending on what test is given, but, but how much do you think is a literacy problem of people not understanding the nutritional information out there versus a just don't care problem where there's motivation really uh, coming up as the issue. Um, and my question for Dr. Cardwell uh, relates to agricultural subsidies. How do you see them um, within Canada particularly, but throughout the world if you like, um, as an important part of dealing with hunger issues throughout the world, um, either as part of the solution or part of the problem? Uh, I think it's both. I think that there are people who have good uh, knowledge, skills, and maybe for a variety of reasons aren't able to act upon those things. But I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of people, including our younger generation, who do not have an adequate set of skills to embrace what I think is an increasingly complex food world and understand how to navigate their way through that. And I'll respond to the um, subsidies question. Uh, agricultural subsidies in developed countries, in rich industrialized countries, have a very mixed effect on food security in developing countries. Uh, on the one hand, subsidies tend to uh, generate overproduction in rich countries, which pushes more supply in the world market, which pushes world food prices down. So if, if you are a net, living in a net food importing developing country, that can be a good thing for food security. It pushes the price down. Uh, trade negotiations uh, between member countries of the WTO are in the process of trying to ratchet down those uh, distortionary subsidies. Uh, so the idea with that is, well, if, if you are in a developing country that cannot compete on a production level because you're not receiving the subsidies, that may be good to increase your income. Uh, but if you're a net food importing developing country, uh, the general consensus is that the, the price of a lot of these food commodities will actually increase as a result of these trade negotiations. if I mean, the reality is that the trade negotiations are becoming very watered down. But if these subsidies were to disappear, you know, the prices for rice and corn and wheat on a global scale would probably go up. So that would be good for some developing countries. It would be bad for others. Mm, thank you. Chris? I guess this is for Dr. Cardwell. Uh, could you comment on uh, the effects of the food for fuel uh, program that's happening over the last X number of years where a very sizable fraction of the corn and uh, other grains perhaps uh, <clears throat> go towards making fuel as opposed to being used for food for humans? Sure. Um, the, the concern has been that uh, crops that, that were used for food several years ago are now going into fuel and, and not just crops but land is being converted from other food crops into fuel crops. So in, in North America, or especially in the US, it's primarily corn uh, to produce ethanol. Um, and, and the concern is that takes the supply out of the food system and it increases the world price. Now this has been a really contested topic over the past 10 years or so, and a lot of economists have tried to estimate an actual, you know, what percentage of recent price increases. For example, I, I put a graph up of, of the price increase in 2008. Uh, a lot of analysts were trying to estimate what a portion of that is attributable to biofuel policies in the U.S., so uh, usage mandates and, and refinery subsidies. And there's a fairly wide range. Uh, the, the consent, well, there isn't really a consensus, but uh, there is agreement that it is significant um, and that if these policies were not in place, that uh, prices for important grain, uh, commodity grains would be lower than they are now. Uh, it's certainly not anywhere in the neighborhood of you know, 20 to 30 percent but it is, it is significant. So, you know, the spike that we saw in 2008 was not caused by uh, biofuel policies, but it, it uh, was perhaps made a little bit worse. And, you know, so that, that is important for 
importing uh, developing countries, people in, that, that import a lot of their commodities. If you live in a developing country that produces a lot of its own food and doesn't trade much, um, for example, in China, a very large producer of grain commodities, but not a large trader of, of grain commodities. So the prices in China weren't nearly as affected as, as a country that may import and export a lot more. So it really depends on where you work. Thanks, Ryan. Question up here. I just have a question coming in through Twitter. Um, faced with encroaching globalization, how can rural communities retain control of their resources? <coughs> Who wants to speak to that? Well, I, I can start. Um, I mean, in industrialized countries, we have a very solid system of, of property rights, uh, and specifically land, land property rights. So um, that doesn't concern me very much. In, in developing countries, uh, land tenure and land rights are much more shaky, and, and that's one of the things I spoke of at the, at the end of my talk uh, regarding institutions that can, that can lead to increased uh, income growth in these countries is, is a strengthening of property rights and, and legal institutions in these countries. And I think that is important. All right. Chris, you have fun? Mayor Bloomberg of New York City has just introduced the reduction of the size of soft drinks. And do you think that that actually is an effective policy? He was successful with the introduction of prohibition of smoking in public places. Uh, but this, does this, is this in the same ballpark? Um, mm. I, I think, uh, will that have a a material effect on New Yorkers' diets? Probably not, but it's probably a symbolic move that could uh, lead to changes in other areas and perhaps start changing some social norms around things like portion size. Hmm. Others? So Chris, there's one right behind you. Thank you. Um, so I have a question just about uh, meat consumption and the studies coming out of Harvard about the link between chronic diseases and our uh, the meat consumption in the North American diet. But also further to your comment, Dr. Cardwell, about biofuels and the entropy that goes into uh, you know raising meat instead of raising grains or whatever for uh, for a growing population. So I was wondering if you could talk about the future of meat consumption at the rate we have now in North America and, and the sustainable food supply. Thank you. Uh, sure, I guess that's directed to me. Um, I mean, uh, th the closest I can come to an answer to that is uh, re regarding the, the energy that's used in, in uh, raising cattle. There was recently a very highly cited paper produced by some food engineers that, that tried to estimate uh, the effect of different types of diets on uh, the greenhouse gas emissions throughout the whole life cycle of the production of the food, so including uh, the inputs going into the food, growing the food, processing it, shipping it, and then driving it from the store to your house. Um, and what they found was that, uh, I probably am going to get the numbers a little bit wrong, but a very small reduction in the typical North American diet's uh, share of, of meat, so it, it might have been as small as 5%, would do more to reduce the, greenhouse, the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions of, your, of a, a North American's diet than would consuming all of your food from within a very short, what would be considered a local, I don't know if it was a 100 mile diet or something like that. So certainly the red meat is a serious factor in the greenhouse gas contributions. If I could uh, comment as well. Um, in, uh, in terms of world consumption of uh, meat products, uh, the average right across the board is about uh, 40, kilograms per person per year. Um, if you look at a country like uh, India, it's down around two kilograms per person per year. In North America, Denmark, New Zealand, they're all close to, if not well above, uh, 100 kilograms uh, per year. Now, what we're seeing is in those countries um, that, that acquire new wealth, there is a rapid growth in the per capita consumption of, of meat products. And, and China is, is probably one where we see the most rapid growth over the last few years as, uh, as the economy improves. Um, this is a difficult choice um, that, that we all face. 
um, in, in terms of the energy inputs associated with growing livestock, um, I don't think what you'll see is, is much in the way of a change in terms of um, consumption of, of animal products uh, in wealthy countries. We do see some decreases as impacts of knowledge about health uh, uh, effects in a negative fashion uh, become more and more uh, visible. Um, and, and so um, in countries like Canada and the United States and New Zealand and Australia, the numbers are actually going down each year. Uh, I just wanted to address the first part of your question. And um, I think it's important when we're looking at uh, food linkages with disease outcomes, uh, especially meat, that meat is not a single food. It's uh, many types of, of foods. And in particular, looking at fresh meat versus processed meat. And I think uh, processed meats, which have been uh, increasing in the diet uh, over the last several decades, um, there's, there's some clear-cut uh, associations with certain diseases, not to mention just the sodium content of them. So it's, uh, yeah, you have to dig a little deeper into the meat issue when looking at uh, disease linkages. Thank you. Over here. Uh, yes, uh, it's a very complex problem, and I'm just going to focus on the, you have a feast in the south, and closer to a famine in the north, yet both of them have serious problems in terms of obesity and diabetes. Now, Manitoba is the capital of the Slurpee. And if you look at the Slurpee, which has probably 14 to 17% sugar in that, in a liter, that's about 140 to 170 grams. On the other hand, if you look at chocolate milk in the supermarket, that has actually, normally there's 4% in the milk and that's 160 grams, but actually they add another 280 grams and there's almost a pound of sugar in chocolate milk. So what is the role of the nutritionist in trying to get not just the consumer, but also companies, because there was recently a, an expose by Marketplace on the top 10 mislabeled products and all of them claim to be natural, and none of them were actually natural. So there seems to be a really a disconnect, and I think the role of nutritionists and, uh, has to be to not just to educate the public, but to have a sense of responsibility. And this certainly affects the community generally, and certainly in the northern communities. And in terms of the northern communities, the question is, what is the responsibility of selecting appropriate foods that will ameliorate? Because if you can reduce diabetes, etc., maybe it does pay to have a, a, a subsidy to get the right foods in, because in the long term, there will be a huge savings to the uh, society. Shirley? So I think this is a question of food culture more than nutrition is do we have a healthy food culture? And when you talk about Winnipeg as a scurpy capital, this is our cultural identity, right? <laughs> we pride ourselves on this. And in the north, oppositely, you know, this traditional food, which is very healthy, it is often meat-based, fish-based, but white fish brings down blood sugar. It has many uh, uh, positive effects for our diabetics. So looking at traditional cultural values and try to embed it in society in a more holistic way, realizing that nutrition education is complex and how can we best approach things. And I think you know, communities or countries with strong food cultures have fared fairly well with this modernization and globalization of food culture. It's places like Canada and um, industrialized countries that have really increased obesity, diabetes, and those other uh, diseases. Joyce? Actually, the global nutrition transition, what we took about 80 years to do is happening in about 10 years in less developed countries. Um, along with the meat consumption comes the consumption of the other processed foods examples that we were looking at earlier. And um, yeah, the, the, the Global public health community is scratching its head, going, "How do we, how do we deal with this?" Um, you know, forums like this, getting ideas out there, 
uh, governments are really struggling, you know, and um, so are consumers. People, people, as, as we advance uh, in a socioeconomic way in, in countries, they're looking to products that uh, we've taken for granted here in, in developed places, and, you know, it's like driving cars. Rick. <clears throat> Michael, uh, would I be correct in, uh, in declaring to the meeting that uh, orange juice uh, is, is not far off in terms of uh, sugar content from a Slurpee at 10%? So, so Slurpees might not be all that bad. <laughs> to go along with the Big Mac, which was... Uh... And, and by the way, folks, Canada is a net exporter of orange juice. We buy it from Brazil and sell it to the Americans and make a good buck. I was afraid for a moment there you were going to say we were a net exporter of Slurpees. But <laughs> uh, other contributions over here? Hi, I've got a question directed to Dr. Slater. Um, you have been, the, the whole purpose of, your, of, the, of the speech you gave was essentially talking about the nutritional value of food and the choices that people make with that nutritional value. I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Oh, sorry. Okay. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Okay. <laughs> I feel like it's a commercial cliche right now. Okay. Um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Uh, yeah, so the whole purpose of uh, the presentation you were giving was to indicate nutritional values uh, within food and how we make choices to either um, take those values and how we, we look at the nutritional products that are given and whether or not we actually know the true value, the true nu nutritional value behind what is being displayed. However, I'm wondering how much of that contribution um, is actually affecting Canadian consumership as opposed to uh, the, pro uh, the price of the products that we are, we are consuming. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, what I'm really trying to say is that a lot of the prices for healthy foods are very inflated, um, whereas the foods that are seen as less, less nutritional are very cheap and more affordable for people who are unable uh, to have a high income and high accessibility to those nutritional foods. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Okay, um, well, a couple of things. I, uh, I was actually just interviewed by the Western producer about this very issue the other week. Um, are healthy foods more expensive than less healthy foods? And the USDA actually just tried to do a study on this using a mathematical modeling, and um, they, they really couldn't. Um, you know, do you do it is it cost per calorie? Is it, you know, how, how would you distinguish those? Um, I, I think we cannot say a blanket statement that healthy foods are more expensive than unhealthy foods. First of all, what are those food categories and how do we come up with them? Secondly, what are you comparing? I mean, if you're comparing uh, processed, frozen macaroni dinner to out of season fresh, fruit, sure, the, that, that healthy fresh fruit is going to be more expensive. If you're comparing a bag of potato chips to fresh potatoes, fresh potatoes win on the lower price every time based on, on weight. The factor that needs to be brought into that is the time and effort required perhaps to turn some of those healthier foods into edible products because of course the, the general rule is the less processed foods are, the more healthier they tend to be. But we need to do some processing of those foods. So I don't know if that's really answered your question. I think we'll always find examples of, of either, and it's, it's a debate that we, we can't necessarily win. Except when we look to the example of places like our far north, where, yes, we can find really clear examples of... Um, of healthy foods being very, very expensive, but you can also find examples of very unhealthy foods, you know, uh, two liters of pot being $8 in a northern community. 
to bring an environmental aspect into it, there's a book called How My Municipal Recycling Program Made Me Fat and Unhealthy. So this idea that processed food often comes in packaging, right? Big packaging that is not paid for for disposal by the companies that produce the food that benefit. They're paid by you as taxpayers, municipal taxpayers. Um, so there are some subsidies, uh, lots of hidden subsidies for processed food. That's one of them. Pop bottles, for example. Um, the local pop shop is gone. People don't pay for their own recycling, reuse or, or recycling. There's no deposit return. So in, in Manitoba, definitely pop is subsidized by your municipal recycling pro program. Ryan? Okay. Can I add one more thing that, that need, does need to be brought up in, in, uh, to argue that uh, processed foods are artificially less expensive? And that's the subsidization of corn in the United States by the uh, US government. So that subsidy, and because corn is in so many of our processed products, does bring that, it's, it's another form of that we don't, it's sort of a hidden subsidy that we don't necessarily see. And Canada, we benefit from that through our, our imports. Ryan? Sure, uh, well I'll just comment uh, regarding the price differences between different products. And, and you know, I'm trained as an economist, so certainly I believe people respond to price incentives. Um, but what we see often in, in studies of um, what we call fat taxes or thin subsidies is uh, th they can be very problematic for two reasons. One is that these policies have a hard time identifying what to target. So, for example, if you target soft drinks, uh, the problem with targeting something like that is then you're taxing something that is not a problem for everybody, right? So if you were to tax a carbon emission to try and reduce CO2 emissions, that's a problem no matter who emits it, right? But if an otherwise healthy person drinks a soft drink, it's not a problem. It doesn't create a health co an added health cost in the future necessarily. So that's one problem. Another problem is that these policies can often actually be regressive. Uh, so typically, lower income, less educated people get more of their calories from unhealthy food. And certainly there's a debate of whether or not those are actually cheaper per calorie. But what we observe is that people do get a lar poor people do get a larger percentage of their calories from unhealthy food. Uh, so if we were to tax these products, that would actually end up being either tax those products, it would be a regressive tax on the people that are consuming them, um, and or if we were to provide thin subsidies on quote healthy foods, the people who would generally benefit the most from these programs are the people's, uh, people at the upper end of the income spectrum who consume more of these products. So they would actually be the largest beneficiaries of these programs. So they're really, they're very difficult and complicated programs to, uh, to implement. Thank you. This has just been fascinating this evening because food is a necessity to live. And whoever would like to address this, I would really be interested in knowing your thoughts on supply management and how that feeds into the bigger question. Dr. Cardwell is kind of giggling, so maybe he wants to start. <coughs> I, knew, I knew it was going to come up. And, um, well, I, I mean, I, I, to be honest, I don't think supply management, it's a very controversial policy. Um, I don't think it's very relevant uh, in, in the context of food security, to be honest. It, I know milk prices uh, were mentioned recently in the press. Uh, with, you know, uh, Premier Selinger uh, was talking about milk prices in the north. Um, and it's unfortunate that he happened to pick milk prices as the example because there's so much going on in supply managed industries that, that distort the market. Uh, but to be honest, I, supply management, whether you're for or against it, I, don't, I think it would be hard to argue that either the presence of it or the absence of it would affect uh, food security in Canada, and certainly not in, in developed countries. Though interestingly, at, at meetings a few years ago, um, I was talking with someone from the chicken farmers of Canada, and he told me that at a recent trade negotiation uh, meeting where, that he was attending, there were people from developing countries approaching him asking about setting up supply managed industries in their countries, which is a really, surprising thing to hear in a developing country. I mean, the, pr the, the primary goal of supply management is to increase the price. And in, in food uh, deficit countries where, where people are food insecure, uh, a policy that, that increases price is, is questionable. But anyways, I, I don't think it's, it's particularly relevant to food security, especially in Canada. That would be my take. Anyone else want to comment on supply management? Okay, there was another question up here. 
Peach or chocolate bar, swim or mad men, save or spend. Can anyone speak to the power of emotional decisions in food or any endeavor? I believe clearly by my question that uh, the overriding issue, perhaps poverty is the overriding issue, but right beside that is uh, the emotional decisions we make with regard to things, not the knowledge we have about them. I believe that I would, I would hope that the vast majority of, let's say, Canadians are well, <coughs> well aware of the issues I just brought up and what the, right, what the right decision is for their health, but the most of us don't make decisions based on rational judgment. So I guess I've kind of answered my question, but I want to know if... Uh, <laughs> let me, I let me see if know. anyone on the panel agrees with you. <laughs> I wanted to know if, if there's any, 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 um, any push towards looking at that element. I guess it's towards uh, Dr. Thompson or anybody who wants to speak towards that. Thank you. Well, I always ask my students for a food memory and the stories that come out and the richness that comes out of events usually linked to... Um, a celebration are are wonderful. Like it's such a rich story. I can't. I that takes over the class and it's lost for the next three hours. There's some so many visual as well as um, uh, emotional inputs to food. And and you know I, I think many of you would say Easter would not be the same or so, spring would not be the same without without strawberries, right? That's what, what spring means to me, is strawberries. And so there's a whole meaning connected with, with our, our tastes. Our tastes. Uh, there's a researcher uh, from Cornell named Brian Wansink, and his entire research program is built around what he calls mindless eating. So I'd encourage you, if you're interested in that, to, to Google mindless eating, and you, you'll, you'll hit his website, and he's got some wonderful resources on there. He's done uh, a lot of research looking at this issue of, of emotional eating, mindless eating. It's very easy to mindlessly eat in our um, society. He does all sorts of experiments where he gives people uh, in movie theaters buckets of stale old popcorn, and they, they finish the bucket because... <laughs> Because you're there, and it's there, and, uh, and uh, yeah. So there, that's a whole area that I think we haven't explored enough um, and, and need to look to. Uh, I, I would still uh, suggest that given the complexity of our current food supply, the, the sheer number of products and availability, that um, people have not got necessarily the level of skill and knowledge that they need to, to interact. And I'll just add that I, I'm just finishing up a study I did uh, looking at home economics, food nutrition education here in Manitoba. And I interviewed home economics teachers about the skill level of grade seven students coming in now versus 20 years ago. And uh, because most of the teachers had, had been there that long. And uh, it's quite a marked difference in students' level of skill coming in now compared to 20 years ago. Just as an example. Right that they have a much lower level of knowledge and skill now than they had 20 years ago. Hello, this is a question coming in via Twitter. Um, and based on your presentations, I think that uh, Dr. Hawley might be the right guy for the job. Um, would love to hear thoughts about C38 changes to CFIA regulations. 38? I'm just reading the tweet. <laughs> Sorry? I'm just reading the tweet as is. Um, my interpretation that it might have been the changes to the inspections that oh, were yeah. announced last week. Yeah. Golly gee. <laughs> You know, I think <clears throat> the changes that, that are being discussed here, I, I believe, or, or that, that form part of the question, are associated with uh, the desire by the federal government to modernize uh, food safety leg food legislation. That includes uh, harmonization of and updating the Food and Drug Act, um, the uh, Meat Inspection Act, uh, Canadian Agricultural Products Act, and the Fish Inspection Act. And the idea <clears throat> was to um, uh, deliver a message to the inspection staff in Canada um, that, that there was a, a, a uniform level of expectation in terms of uh, 
uh, what their jobs represented. If you take a look at the different legislation, and some of it goes back to 1955 and beyond, uh, each one of those acts provides the, um, the inspector that is described in that act with a different set of responsibilities, different expectations. And, and so the, um, the expectations of, a, of an inspector that, that's inspecting fish plants is different from an inspector that's inspecting poultry plants. Well, guess what? In today's um, um, organization of uh, job responsibility, on Monday an inspector might be in a fish plant and on Thursday he might be in a poultry plant. So the idea, I think, essentially is good to, to um, make the, uh, the inspection staff uh, aware of what the expectations are, whether they're in a fish plant, an egg plant, a poultry plant, or for that matter, a cucumber plant. Um, so, so that the, in, the inspector, and, and this is where, where the nub comes. Um, in, in terms of um, the, the type of inspections that we've seen take place, whether it's at the federal level, the provincial level, et cetera, um, it's all too easy for an inspector to write a report that identifies almost cosmetic issues as, as being the bulk of the report that he sends to his supervisor rather than, and it's more difficult, to get at the operation of the food safety system and, and analyze critical issues that are important in terms of food safety. Um, and, and so if this change brings about an opportunity for the inspection staff to concentrate on interrogating the operation of the food safety system so, so that its performance yields food products that are safer for all of us to eat, then I'm all for it. But I'm unsure as to whether or not that will happen. Okay. Chris? There's one up behind you. <clears throat> I, had, I had two questions. Uh, the first question would be directed towards Dr. Hawley. And with the, your comments about the high levels of E. coli and salmonella that are found in the food that's given to animals and in, in meat that we p consume, is there any correlation between that and increased antibiotic resistance in humans? And then the second question was, uh, regarding dairy products and why are dairy products in the United States so much cheaper than in Canada? The, the first part of the question, Ryan, you can handle the second. Because <laughs> I think we're getting ripped off. <laughs> um, the relationship between uh, numbers of, of E. coli and, uh, and salmonella uh, in, the, in the animal feed uh, and relations, relationships uh, to antibiotic resistance. Um, I don't think there's a correlation, um, but um, what we do know is, is that anywhere from uh, 17 to 50 percent of the animal feed that we're using right now is contaminated with either or both of these organisms. Now it's a, it's a really tough issue to address and, and those of you who have worked on farms or own farms uh, fully understand what these problems are. Nonetheless, I don't think we as, as, uh, as mature thinking individuals assessing a problem like foodborne illness can ignore this because there is evidence of the connection between animal feed contamination, animal contamination, food contamination, and human illness caused by the same organisms. It's not extensive, it does exist. The continuum is difficult to study but uh, I, I think that uh, uh, the proof will be in the pudding as we see more and more instances of foodborne illness being caused by foods today than, than uh, in the past when our environment wasn't so contaminated. I can talk more about that, but I know I'm going to get kicked in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Relative to antibiotic resistances, I think it's... Uh, um, <laughs> you did, didn't you? No, okay. um, we in North America, not in Europe uh, today, uh, currently use um, antibiotics at, at sub-therapeutic levels as growth promoting agents. And, and the, the benefit there 
seems, seems to relate to um, the action of the antibiotics in the animal gut to uh, reduce the numbers of organisms that compete for nutrients with the animal digestive system. And so the, the, the benefit to the farmer is, is about 10 percent in, in terms of pro animal productivity in terms of the use of antibiotics. Well, the medical community looks at this and says, well, um, you know, any thinking person is, is, is going to know that the more you use um, an element like uh, uh, a challenge element in an environment against a particular uh, organism, that organism, uh, depending upon its rate of reproduction and growth, is going to be able to respond faster or slower to develop a way around that issue of the challenge. And it's very true of uh, antibiotics and antibiotic use that the more we use them, the more we see antibiotic resistances in bacteria that are exposed to them. Having said that, I think it's important for us all to realize that uh, studies have shown that there is innate antibiotic, innate I-N-N-8, resistance to antibiotics in bacteria. There was a study recently at, that was done at uh, McMaster University. They went up north, sampled the permafrost. They went down into the permafrost 30,000 years, and they brought up bacterial DNA <coughs> that showed that some of the bacteria that were in existence 30,000 years ago had genetic information that would allow them to be resistant to four antibiotics that we use in clinical medicine today. So, having said that, I think that the current wisdom of the day uh, would be that um, the long-term future of antibiotics as growth promotants in, uh, in North America is very limited but it may not solve the antibiotic resistance problem. Thanks, Rick. And I'll give the final word to Ryan, and then I'll ask Gary to sum up. Sure. Um, just regarding high dairy prices in Canada, uh, just very, very quickly, it's, it's primarily because of the supply management system in Canada. The supply management uh, policies uh, reduce or set a quota on allowable output uh, within Canada, and they set that below what would be the case in a competitive market, and then imports are prevented from coming into the country with very high two to three hundred percent tariff rates, so uh, there's no foreign competition faced by domestic producers, so prices are, are markedly higher than they would be across the border. Thank you. As I mentioned at the beginning, I'm going to ask Dr. Gary Glavin, Associate Vice President of Research, to just summarize the evening. Thank you, David. Um, and I'd first like to thank the members of the audience for coming out this evening. Uh, I think we were uh, treated to a very stimulating conversation this evening. I'd also like to thank the members of the uh, discussion panel this evening uh, for their insights into these problems. Now, someone who is prone to uh, bad puns and, and, and bad humor might say that after tonight's conversation that it left them hungry for more, but I'm not one of those people, so of course I wouldn't say that. I think, I think it's a fair conclusion that we heard that the issue of food security is not just a third world issue. It's in our own backyard. It's in our north. And judging by the amount of use of food banks, uh, Winnipeg Harvest, for example, we're constantly uh, reminded of how many people, including young people, including children, who are using the food bank. So the issue of food security is not just something over there somewhere else in the world. It's in our backyard. I think we take food security for granted in a country like Canada, which is an incredibly prosperous country and an incredibly gifted and, and well-off country. And we shouldn't take it for granted. And we heard also that that because of the abundance of food and food choices that we have, we tend to always not to make the best of choices. We tend to make some unhealthy choices. And I think the best way I've heard of this characterized is a combination of two words. We are in Canada and North America facing a diabesity epidemic, com combining diabetes and obesity, calling it a diabesity epidemic, which isn't in the future, it's here and it's now. I have a good colleague who's the director of all counter bioterrorism in the United Kingdom. He's got a bit of a chore on his hand these days with the Queen's Diamond Jubilee in the Olympics. And he's very fond of saying the following. The only thing more difficult than planning for an emergency is explaining why you didn't. And I think what we have in this, in, in our world, and certainly in our own backyard, is already an emergent situation 
with, with food insecurity, with, with inadequate access by certain groups in society to food. So I think that situation is already here. And finally, on a sort of a semi-personal note, I have another good friend who, who runs a very large research, research institute in this country, and he was asked once if he liked his job. And he said, a surrogate for that, a good way of getting at that is, it's how you feel driving to work on a Monday morning. Well, you heard tonight from just four of our very fine researchers at this university, but in my job in the research portfolio, I get to work with researchers from all across this campus, from every faculty, from every department, from every research institute, and I can tell you that it's a pleasure and a privilege to be able to work at this university and interact with people, some of whom you heard from this evening. So I can very safely say that, it's, that I can't wait to get to work on any day of the week, let alone Monday morning. So thank you very much for coming out this evening, and thank you to everyone. Thank you, Gary. And again, on, on your behalf, thanks to uh, the panelists. Very stimulating discussion. And I want to add my thanks to you personally as well. Thank you for coming. And thank you for making this year of Visionary Conversations, our first season, uh, a success. We hope to see you back here in September when we'll kick off the second season of Visionary Conversations. And that session will be one of our featured events of uh, Homecoming 2012. We expect to conduct nine events in total next year, uh, some here at the Fort Garry campus, some at the Bannatyne campus. The full schedule will be available soon on our homepage at uh, umanitoba.ca. Uh, so please plan on joining us here in this room on September 12th at 6.30 uh, for the first session of next year. We're already well into planning next year, but we still are open to uh, to your input. There were some surveys available. I hope you picked one up on the way in and we would really value your response to those. So please fill out the survey uh, you received and leave it with us because your views will help us determine topics for future visionary conversations. And once again, thank you for coming. Have a great summer and we'll see you for the fall series. Thank you.